to the Rex Andrews Show. Glad to have you. If you're a first-time listener, welcome. We're glad to have you in the conversation. Please don't forget to hit the subscribe button. And of course, because I'm a well-dressed beggar and I'm never ashamed to do so, please give us five stars if you think we've deserved it, or maybe not. And then I always want to say to our returning listeners, thank you very much. Because of you and a combination of our amazing guests, we have rocketed into the top 10 fastest growing podcasts in the world, which is quite the accomplishment for you folks out there because there are more than a million podcast choices in the iTunes market. Okay, before we get into the story for this week, uh, the quick house clean thing, just like normal, don't forget to subscribe wherever you are. If you don't like the podcast platform you're on, that's okay. You can find another. There's 23 of them out there that carry us worldwide. The show is listened to in 32 countries on, on six continents. And if we could figure out how to market to penguins, we'd be on seven. All right. So uh, don't forget to hit the show website too, because we have bios and information on all of our guests, you know, previous, today's current one, and upcoming guests. Lots of interesting people, interesting stories. All right. Uh, the show website is, I almost forgot to give it out today, it's rexandrewshow.com. And then, of course, you can find us on all those social media platforms. All right. Great to uh, share this story today. I always tell people, you know, I get tired of hearing it, but I'm never tired of saying it. Um, I have too many little interests for just one lifetime, and around every corner is another discovery. So our discovery today is with a professional. I think you're really going to enjoy her today. Um, She's a former attorney, and some of my people say recovering. I'm not sure if that's the right application, but a frequent career changer. Uh, But once you've been an attorney, that's a pretty in-depth career, but some people do escape. And she's an author, and in fact, she's an author of the Build Your Dream Network. So I'd like to welcome to the show today, Kelly Hoey. Kelly, how are you today? I'm great, Rex, and really thrilled to be here. Yeah, it's going to be fun. All right. So we kind of do this thing, play along. And so people who might be multitasking in front of a computer or on their device or what have you, where's a good place for people to find you so they can connect with your content besides the show website? Uh, my own website, best place to go, jkellyhoey.co, J-K-E-L-L-Y-H-O-E-Y dot C-O. Fantastic. Thank you for spelling that out because uh, the way the domains are these days, who knows what things really are spelled like. All right. So on the show, as people know, we are a human interest and human story show, interesting people, interesting things. Sometimes certain people are more interesting than others. But uh, I'd like to go back to the beginning, and because we always know that we are today as part of a makeup of who we were yesterday. And so I'd like to know, going back to the beginning, you know, where were you born? You know, how many siblings did you have? Uh, what types of activities did you do growing up as a kid? So if you were interested in sports or music, drama, computers, shoplifting, you don't have to tell the stories. Um, Anything you were doing that you were doing through your spare time, uh, what types of, uh, of uh, careers and jobs your parents had, so that kind of adds some influence, uh, so maybe some of your schooling, and then we'll hop clear up to today. So can you tell us where this all started uh, out, Kelly? This all started in Victoria, British Columbia, Canada, southern tip of Vancouver Island. Uh, I am the middle child of three, two brothers, one who is an artist, the other who is a social worker. Uh, I was, you know, I would say your typical, I don't know, typical kid, public school, education, played sports, did went to ballet, took piano lessons, uh, you know. Tried to man, you know, mind my P's and Q's and stay out of trouble and uh, do what my parents wanted me to do. Uh, maybe that's why I uh, okay. went right off, right, right, right off to university after graduating. I didn't take a gap year and then. Uh, okay, well, I'm going to stop you, know, you there for a minute. Now stop, you said stop you, me there. You said something that I I picked up on. Uh, did all the things your parents expected you to do. So were some of your sports or dance or those things, were they expected to do things or did you have passions for them? I want to say the kinds of things that you, oh, I'm saying, you know, let's just show how old we are, Rex. You know, back in the day when you actually had physical education as part of the school curriculum. Yes. Yeah, right. I, I, I'm, I'm from that era. So it was kind of your friends did it. So you did it. 
uh, you know, your friends did track and field, played field hockey, played basketball, was on the volleyball team. Can't say I was particularly good at any of those things. Uh, but, you know, I kind of did them all because my friends were doing them. Um, yeah, I so would, I would say back from that era, too. I can remember when signing up for um, high school classes and my fees, the cost of my gym suit was a major uh, portion of uh, school registration fees. And in fact, I hate to admit this, but when I was a senior in high school, last semester of school, out of the six classes that I was forced to be enrolled in, you could take seven. Uh, four of them were gym or gym classes. So. Yeah, it's kind of cool. That's that's <laughs> I know. That's 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 kind of great when you think about it. You think about now some of the things we're learning about. Uh, you know, I say creativity, you know, overall wellness, and, and you think about things that we're not encouraging kids to do in school. So some of this, you know, looking back and thinking the things we had to do, like physical education and art classes, it's, you know, it's a shame that they're not standard curriculum anymore. Yeah, I'd agree with that. My youngest is a senior in high school, and now thanks to the pandemic and all the nonsense around some of those things, she hasn't been in a school building in a year and a half, but... Uh, a gym class isn't even on her radar, but I will give the school district credit. Uh, she had a virtual bowling class, online bowling. So uh, they, yes, absolutely serious. A bowling class that they basically got online on Zoom. The teacher takes attendance. They yak for about 10, 15 minutes, and then everybody gets an A, and that's, that's online bowling. So welcome to uh, education during the pandemic. So crazy. If anyone watching this can see I'm smiling and laughing. Oh, yeah, dear. Oh, sure. dear. Oh, dear. We will survive this, Rex, and get on to, you know, yep, whatever so. our future world is. That's for sure. So you went on to university. What did you plow into? What were the interests? What did you get, you know, what you focus on in university years? Uh, so, and, and, you know, my, my parents, uh, my, my mother's a school teacher, my father's okay. a veterinarian. Uh, there was really sort of one of those things. It was, there was not an option. It was not a debatable thing about whether one went off to school. Sure. Uh, so, uh, cause they had, they had those kind of degrees and it was sort of expected. Did an undergraduate uh, poli sci in economics. Okay. Um, I think I, I mean, know I, where this is going. Yeah. Well, and it's funny, you know, when I think back at undergraduate and, you know, maybe it's the good fortune of, uh, the time I was in school, um, for those, you know, would like to look back, you know, the age of the dinosaur, the 80s, um, yep. you know, a, a, and in Canada, it was very affordable. So, you know, when I was in my undergraduate, even though I, I majored in political science and minor in economics, you know, I took classes like Russian cinematography and, you know, you, you, you could explore, I could take a computer science class, you, you explore and you could learn to think and you could kind of figure out what you were doing and really look at it as how you could get a degree um, and gain some, some kind of exploration of who you were and what the world was. Uh, when I graduated, it was like, okay, what next? I was a legislative intern uh, for a year in okay. province of British Columbia, uh, survived that, and uh, have avoided politics <laughs> ever since. <laughs> That's probably a really good thing based on today's day and age. And uh, then it was like, okay, what do I do now? Um, and I, you know, this is one of those things where I'd say, you know, you, sometimes you get ideas of what you can do in a world by those who are around you. And I had a very, you know, limited view of what were career possibilities based on the influences I had, uh, okay. of, you know, my close family and what was, what would be an acceptable for me to do. So medicine was out. Uh, I was like, yeah, dad, that's great. You're a veterinarian. No interest in that stuff. Uh, so I was sort of looked at, I could get a medical degree, an MBA or a law degree. And I decided, well, let's go for law. Uh, and that's why I went to law school uh, and uh, went to the University of British Columbia, got my okay. law degree. And then that was in 91. And I made a very practical based on finances decision to accept a job with a law firm in Toronto. Okay. And well, that, clear across the country. Sure. Yeah. Because at the time, the cost of living in Vancouver was the same as Toronto. Yep. And the salaries in Toronto were more than double. Sure, sure. So I was like, hey, there's easy. I'll, yeah. I'll move for a colder winter because they're paying more. <laughs> yeah. So you did take some math classes along the way, it sounds like. Yeah, I may not have wanted to do the stats and the requirements to do an MBA, but I could do some basic math, yes. Basic math, yeah. So you uh, shuffled off to Toronto. Did you go to work for a big firm? Did you, were you working for a corporation? What was your step into being a lawyer? 
I went and worked for a, it was a, it was a, at the time, it was a very solid mid-sized Toronto firm. Uh, they've now expanded to uh, a large national presence in Canada. And I was at that firm for four years. Okay. Um, I had a pretty open mind about what to work on and got staffed on a friend. I was a major Canadian insolvency, a real estate developer, and that was fun. So I did a lot of banking and insolvency law, moved to another firm, a very big Toronto-based firm, to continue doing that kind of uh, restructuring uh, and banking work. And then, uh, you know, lo and behold, fell in love with a Texan and uh, moved to New York City. Oh, wow. Well, okay, let's unpack a little of that. So you were in a great position in Toronto there because you were young, you had a great job, great pay, uh, you know, oh, freewheeling. And then this damned, actually, his formative years were spent in Colorado. So I think he would say that he was more of a Denverite, but we'll okay. blame it on him being a fifth generation Texan. Okay. Uh, enticed me to New York City, and I've been here since uh, 1998. So what in the heck does your, your Texan that lives in New York do? Um, he was in the restructuring business. Okay. So that's... Turn around, same. turn around, turn around, interim CEO, turn around guy. Okay, Fantastic. So I'm yeah. assuming it was in those circles that you met him uh, in Toronto is in some of that turnaround mm -hmm. and finance and all that kind of good stuff as an attorney. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Listen, yeah, you're, you're in a, you know, an area of law that, and, and, you know, the all sort of supporting accoutrement of, around it. And there's 200 people in court and there's two women. It's, you know, it's a way to stand out, you know, yeah. in a, in a okay. busy market and, and get, you know, catch someone's eye. Let me tell you. <laughs> so you've been in New York for quite some time then, right? Yeah, I, you get an interesting combination now, Rex. Uh, you know, sanctimonious Canadian crossed with a New Yorker, so watch out. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. <laughs> I have some jokes come to mind, but I'm going to let those go right on past. So uh, we'll get that going. So uh, how long did you continue on with the lawyer thing? Did you stay as a lawyer once you got to New York, or did you pivot and do something new? Um, I continued in law it was, so this was the late 90s so that you know that was right right before the dot-com you know bubble burst yep. and all that so there was lots of lots of job opportunities for lawyers at that time uh so i came down worked uh at a major uh u.s firm and global firm a major u.s firm for four years and sort of then in 2001 2002 i was like i'm ready for change um, okay. and, and kind of did that back of the envelope. What do I like about my job? What do, do I, don't I like about my job? Um, uh, and what do I want to do next? And, uh, so started in 2002 to make my first career pivot. Okay. And what was that? I moved still kind of thinking very narrowly about where my skills and abilities could be Rex. I moved from being a attorney to being the manager of professional development, uh, guarding over and guiding the careers of attorneys. And I did that at another um, global law firm. And I was their manager of professional development, ran their, ran, built and ran their women's initiative, and then moved into marketing to build out an alumni program. And I was at that firm for five and a half years. Wow. Well, I thought you were going to take this dramatic pivot and that, you know, you were going to be the manager of professional development at, oh, I don't know, Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey, but you stayed in well, the legal firm. You stayed in the legal profession. I know. I was still really myopic and sort of really like, like those horses you see taking tours around Central yeah. Park, you know, like the little blinders on. I still had a really limited view of where my skills and my possibilities could do. Okay. So, yeah. yeah so yeah. you wrote that out for five years and then then what was the next step? It sounds like it. Uh, you it had took some... a big turn, Rex, big after turn. that. Okay. <laughs> Let's talk about that big turn and what was the. What was the thing that contributed to that pivot? Well, you know, the, the sort of lessons along the way, you know, there was the lessons of building relationships and growing relationships from when I was an attorney. And then there was the lessons when I made that first career move of, of having to expand and diversify networks. And so I continued to do that. And then, you know, a third lesson for people who are listening. So I was, it was in that role of a manager of global alumni programs. And I was given this big responsibility to build a, rebuild the firm's alumni uh, initiative because it's, you know, a good source of business development and recruiting for, you know, professional services, organizations, corporations, stuff like that. Right. Um, and I was given no budget or resources. 
Mm. I swear to God. I was like, hey, here, Kelly, could you do this? But no budget and resources. So I thought to myself, I need to find an example in the world where a community, like an alumni community has grown um, and accelerated based on the enthusiasm and the activity of the membership. Because I don't have money and budget to hire people to pull the community together. I don't have money and budget to bestow gifts that makes everyone come running and want to join. So right. I'm going to find an example. So I got really involved with a global business network um, for women that had grown out of Goldman Sachs. Okay. Uh, and so the name of the network at the time was 85 Broads, tongue in cheek, um, <laughs> play, play on the old address of Goldman Sachs's yep. headquarters, which was 85 Broad Street. Yep. And I got involved as a member and got really involved mostly to do due diligence and mostly to kind of be like LA detective to figure out what were they doing that enabled them to grow from a cocktail party of a hundred former women who worked at Goldman Sachs to now being a global network of 35,000 women from across finance and business and startups and all the rest of it. And run by like a team of three. And wow. I was like, I gotta figure this out because sure. this could be a model that I could use to help me build the alumni program I'm trying to do for this law firm. So I was very active and it was probably nine months into my activity. So they had a website, I had a full profile, they had a website, you could contribute blogs, I contributed blogs. Sure. They had breakfasts, I attended, they asked for volunteers, I raised my hand, anything I could do to ask questions and like dig around, I did. Sure, right. And it was about nine months into being a member and the founder called me and she said, I wanna know who you are, I wanna know what you do, Tell me about yourself. Mm -hmm. And we talked on the phone for approximately an, an hour. And at the end of that hour, she offered me a job that previously had never existed. And I became wow. the first, first president, uh, global president of 85 Broads. Wow. I know. That's, that's impressive. All right. So she, she was so impressed right on the spot. She invented a job for you. But, you know, and I'm sure, and she did invent it on the job. Knowing, having then worked, working with Janet over the next year, I know she invented it on the spot because that's the way she operated. Okay. She was, she is so brilliant and so visionary and sees things and she sees and recognizes talent. And when she sees something, she's like, all right, how do I figure out a way to make this happen? Yeah. Jump right on. She was, she was also a, she was also a trader on Wall Street at Goldman Sachs. And so when they see a good trade and something they want to act on, they do not on wait. It. That's <laughs> they right. move on it. <laughs> that's right. You know, that's a trade I wish more people had. So many people will vacillate themselves to death trying to do wait till something's perfect and they miss their opportunities. So Yeah. Hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so I kind of created an opportunity by, you know, being making myself visible. Um, and you know, I really, I love that we're sort of, you've, you've allowed me the space to delve into that story more because for anyone listening, they all have that same chance. Like we can all slide our credit card and become a member of something. We can say, sure. oh, yeah, I'm a member of this organization or this association, but you have a choice. You can, you know, just sort of have that name there or you can get involved. Um, right. And a lot of these um, times with those kind of membership sort of situations, you know, it's up to you. Like yeah. you, you, you make your own magic. Exactly. I, you know, I had a friend, you know, I've done a lot of things. People accuse me of being ADD, but there's an element of that to this, um, to my walk through uh, life. But I've always ha had a friend for the longest time that I would always, you know, meet him up for a beer or whatever and say, Hey, you know, talk about this or that. And I'd say, ah, oh, it's just luck. You're like it had no something to do with luck. Correct. So he says, you're the guy that just stirs things up. And then that's what you walk home with on your shirt. It isn't luck, okay? It's the stuff that you stir it up. So I am a firm believer. And anybody has the ability to do just about anything if they'll just stir things up. Right. You make your own luck. Stir it up. Make your own luck. Put your yeah. career in front of serendipity. You know, however you want to describe it. But, you know, um, the sort of the sitting and wishing something would happen or sending out, you know, 50 resumes with the same cover letter. Yeah. That's yeah. not going to make magic, baby. That's never going to make it happen. So um, with 
the 85 broads is that still in that like is it an exclusive women's organization or network yes um okay. so it's now it was um it was sold to sally krawcheck and i'm trying to think what year that was so it's now known as elevate elevate okay yeah, and Sally's, there's been a lot of uh, sort of headlines on that because of uh, there's a, an investment arm of it now. Um, Sally had headed up wealth management at Bank of America or Merrill Lynch Bank of America. Uh, so there's very much a focus on uh, like an index of, you know, funds and things selected by women or run by women. So there's that investment arm, but there is still this networking membership yeah. driven part as well. So this was in the early 2000s that you did this then? Was that, is that right? That, that would have been um, 2009, 2010. Okay, yeah. There was a period when networking was such a huge, huge, and I'm not saying it isn't today, but there was a period where that was an, a, a very visible and fast growing part of being a professional. And it didn't matter what, what industry you're in um, to do that. You know, we don't, there are so many trades out there and, and lines of work that don't have unions, um, but these base take the place of those in many ways to be able to socialize, connect, and, the, and uh, be able to be a part of something. And there was a big push of that through the late 90s in 2010. So I know it's still out there in, in a way, but um, it was really a big trend, an upcoming trend at that time. Yeah, yeah, and and you know, for having been you know all those years as an uh, as an attorney, you had to belong to a bar association. So sure. there would always sort of that similar kind of professional organization. And some of those things are great for the relationships, or it might be great for the information flow in terms of what you know the trends, things in the industry. And then I think we've seen such a proliferation, almost like a niching of of networking groups. You know, like. Um, you know, the mom project, you know, like just for yep. working moms and returnship programs, or, you know, they're very like niche slices um, across populations. And it can get, um, I get a little overwhelming uh, because there's so much out there and you wonder where to choose and where to yeah, invest your time. Where to put your time as I just about to say that. Okay. So this obviously not where the story ended. So take me from there. That story goes on. So 85 Broads and that opportunity gave me incredible visibility, as you can well imagine. And uh, it also really, again, kind of exposed me to so many new and different networks. Uh -huh. So the next year, so I did that for a year uh, as, as president and um, it whetted my appetite kind of to do things on my own and, and do things entrepreneurially. So, so I should back up, you know, when I took that role with 85 Broads, you know, I left a job with a paycheck and benefits. You know, as I mentioned, I'm I'm Canadian. I like healthcare, sure. so all of a sudden, I'm like, I'm taking a leap. I'm taking a leap, and it was into an opportunity that was uh, equity only. Oh wow! Uh, yeah. yeah. So it was it was so you can see it was a really kind of uh, a big change from someone who had grown up you know, kind of working for someone else, linear uh, career model, move sure. up hierarchy, mm -hmm. you know, natural progression up the ladder, you know, you knew what your salary was going to be in two years time because it was all kind of lockstep. And then taking this massive flyer uh, on myself uh, with this opportunity from Janet. And one of the reasons I chose to do that was someone said to me, what's the worst that can happen? And I was kind of looked at them and said, uh, you know, you sort of go to something, you think you're going to be homeless or living under a bridge or, right. you, know, you know, whatever. And she said, you come back here and do your old job. And I'm like, oh, that's right. I have a reputation in this industry. I could go and be manager of professional development or do legal marketing in a year somewhere else. Like, I, yeah. I'll keep the, I'm going to maintain those relationships. I could dive yeah. back and do that. I'll just yeah. take, do this for a year. Why not? Uh, not that, not that huge of a risk, right? But yet, yeah, when you have relationships and you've built a reputation and you haven't just relied on having your head down and doing a job, you, you, can, this, you could step back to move ahead again. Uh, but at the end of the year, I really wet, whetted my appetite for entrepreneurship. So I did some consulting and things. And then I got a call one day uh, from two women in the startup community. And mm -hmm. they said, can we meet you? Uh, we have an idea. And every time we talk to people about it, and talk about what we need in a third co-founder, your name keeps coming up. Mm. And I'm like, well, okay, let's find out what this little idea is. 
And so I was convinced uh, and signed on to be the third co-founder of a startup accelerator. We invested in uh, mobile first um, emerging technology companies that had female founders. Okay. Uh, and that was a fun, grand experiment. I'm glad I did it. I'm glad I'm not doing it anymore. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh, that, again, in terms of, you know, trying something new, sh- you know, f- developing a, again, sort of almost like one of the niche networks that I had and was developing with when I was in Indy Five Broads, it, it really deepened that network in terms of my connections within the startup community. And that's led to all sorts of interesting and intriguing opportunities. Um, it's why I was on a hackathon from... San Francisco to London, England. Yeah, it's why I got to meet Malala. It's like crazy things that I would never have done if I'd continued to be a you know sure. corporate attorney. Sure. Uh, so I did that. Um, and when we decided to close up shop on, on that accelerator um, situation, I was an interim CMO of emerging tech company for a short period of time. And then I kind of had a time to Rex to pause and go, all right, Owie, what is the common thread between all these wacky things that you've done? What Mm -hmm. is the question you're constantly asked? Um, And maybe in that uh, is the answer to what you should do next. And that was why and where uh, the book Build Your Dream Network was the genesis of it. Okay. Well, I was going to predict that with the, but I already knew the outcome, but I was still, I was just sitting there listening. Well, you know, what is the common thread? So tell me, tell us what that's, what it is. Okay. Well, I would say it's the way I look at and build relationships and the way the lessons of various careers, but also the activities that I continue to do. So it's mm-hmm. not like I show up and start networking. Uh, you know, there was a, a deep client relationship uh, and I want to say sort of micro networking habits from when I was a busy attorney Mm -hmm. um, that have helped me build relationships without schmoozing around. Uh, There was the lessons of diversifying networks. Uh, There was just this very thoughtful, deliberate process. The funny thing is a boss I had back in 2000, let me think, I had Kim was my boss from like 2005-ish maybe, 2004, 2005, yeah, no, 2005. Uh, around 2006, 2007, this boss, I had Tim Whitney, uh, and he is named in the book and the uh, acknowledgements. He said to me, Kelly, you have to tell people what you do. You, you, the way you network is different. You need to talk to people about this and you need to, do, you know, you need to share that. Right. And I looked at him and told him it was the stupidest thing I'd ever heard of. <laughs> Yes, I had to eat crow, Rex, when that book, when I finally decided to write a book. I was like, a decade later, I was like, Tim, you were right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so um, without going on a uh, two-hour monologue here, what makes uh, your process different? Okay. What are you doing different in networking that makes it unique and special compared to somebody who just joins one of these organizations and attends the meetings? Well, I think we think of networking as talking with strangers and and an activity exactly as you described. Like you have to get out and network, which means go and schmooze around a room and grab some business cards and, you know, hope some magical stranger, you know, anoints you or, you know, dusts you with magic glitter or shows you the, the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. And I take the very strong view that networking and building a network requires showing up every day for your network. Yeah. So for me, networking is every single human interaction because every interaction is the chance to build further develop a relationship. So how you send an email, uh, how you respond to a text, do you remember a birthday? Do you say hello? Do you help a colleague out? Do you refer information to them that you think might be of interest? Do you think of them or refer them when someone else asks for help and it's not your specialty or skill set? Do you say, damn, this is a good podcast. Let me share it with somebody else. Right. That to me is networking. And if we start looking at those acts, those little micro activities as networking, you realize you have more opportunities on a daily basis to develop um, a strong, robust network 
that doesn't require a bunch of time spent schmoozing with strangers thinking, why am I doing this? Yeah. I have a fun story that, that fits into the, your vein and I know you'll like this. So uh, I have spent a lion's percentage of my software career in sales and, and business development and selling software at enterprise levels. So very large companies. So when my family came back to Denver, cause we did this uh, 11 year run around the country, follow the career thing and then come back home. Um, I, there was an, an organization, I won't name the organization, they're still around, but it was essentially all the executive level IT directors and CIOs, CTOs. So, you know, the, the top executive, chief executive that was there. Now I was selling enterprise software. I was selling Oracle um, software and services. So that's my customer base. And so I went to some meetings and it was funny because they had some token vendors and that was mainly so you had some people to pay for golf, you know, the golf outings. I mean, that's that's really kind of how they did it. And I looked around the room and it just kind of did this first assessment. Like these guys are all geeks. These guys are not guys that are going to be out, you know, looking to help grow the organization as much as they'd like to and stuff. Well, at that very first meeting, they announced that the, um, the, the membership chair had left and had moved out of state, moved down to Dallas. So they were looking for a new membership, you know, director. Bingo, hand right up. Woo, I took it over. And, it, and I learned completely. Now, most of these gentlemen and ladies are near retirement now or have retired because of the there, you know, this was like 15 years ago. But what was great is I went to work for the IT directors, you know, organization. I got to know everybody in town. I tripled the size of the organization because I'm just willing to talk to people. I'm in sales. That's what I do. So come be a part of this. And so Every day I worked as my job to build, help build that organization on their benefit. Cause none of these guys really like to go, you know, solicit and grow the, uh, you know, the organization. I helped the chapter over in Salt Lake city build theirs. And so, but the, the outcome of it, which was really not intended, it was just sort of my hands-on farmer kid approach is I had the most intricate and deep connections of these executives I could get an appointment anywhere. I could show up and be a trusted advisor. I wasn't viewed as a sales rat, okay? So I'm not the guy coming in, you know, to sell you something today. Hey, I'm here to talk about this or that. I happened to have everybody that was a decision maker quality in my marketplace that I wanted. I had their cell phone numbers. I had their home phone numbers. I had their personal emails. I had their business emails. And but you I, had their trust. And I had their trust. And so serendipitously, you know, not even knowing what the depth of what you're doing. I accidentally did this at one point in time. And it was the best thing but, for my but, career. But it's amazing. But also think about like how many other people raised their hands when they said they needed a membership chair? Nobody. Bingo. And the times when we don't realize these little activities, right? This opportunity like anyone else in the room had the chance any of the other vendors had the chance to raise their hand and mm -hmm. nobody did oh god who wants that yeah that's gonna no rather than saying you know what being the membership chair gives me the chance to build relationships and network without trying to get these it and cio guys or gals to go for lunch or go for a round of golf instead you're calling them up saying you know what how can we serve you better yeah. You know, how can this organization serve you better? What are your needs? You get the chance to listen and talk to them. Yep. And like the fact no one else raised their hand, like I didn't know the answer to that question. That's silly me, past lawyer. I should have known the answer to the question I was going to ask you. Right. But I was suspecting no one else raised their hand. It wasn't like a fight for that because somebody else wouldn't have observed sharing that committee as a network building opportunity. Oh, it was, it was the best of my life. And in fact, um, I left the Oracle consulting firm like, about three, four years into doing that, starting that. And I was the, the, the membership chair for like six years. But I used that network to actually obtain other jobs as an asset that I brought to that job is, hey, I'm walking into, and this dates me, I'm walking into this opportunity for you as a business development expert with a Rolodex, okay? That old term, a Rolodex, it just happens to include everybody in Colorado and Utah of substance that would buy enterprise type products. And they'd be falling all over themselves, you know, and stuff. And, oh, did I need budget to go to those meetings and do it? You know, cause 
none of this was coming out of my pocket, of course. So the next two employers that I had, they literally would just, whatever you need, you, the fact that you have those relationships and get into it. So what, what relationships through everything. Yeah. And so what started out is just sort of a, well, okay, I'll do, I'll help. And then it was the light went on and then further, it turned into an extremely beneficial situation for me because of that. And I still have on LinkedIn, I'll see some of these guys, you know, announcing their retirement or they're working on this project now, you know, cause they've taken a golden parachute and jumped onto those things and stuff. And so great relationships, but I would probably say about three quarters of those guys are now retired because I'm 55 They're These guys aren't going to hang out forever, but, uh, it was serendipitous that I did it. And I, uh, if, if I were to talk to somebody else who was in similar shoes, if they're in that spot, do something like that. And don't just be mm-hmm. a member, go in and go to work for them. Yeah, go to work well, for I was saying, yeah exactly. Don't just show up and say, oh, how am I going to, oh God, there's a task. I don't want to do it. Like what can you turn it into? And one of the stories, because um, Builder Dream Network is filled with sort of roadmap case studies, not just my story, good networking habit, don't just talk about yourself. Uh, But one of the stories uh, in there, a woman by the name of Jennifer Johnson, she took a job in New York City, city she didn't live in, so new city, Mm -hmm. new new employer, she was hired to build a new business line with a bunch of people she didn't know. So she was like, what do I do? And she found, like you, found an organization. So she was looking at uh, recruiting uh, actively recruiting and hiring to, to hire into CMO jobs in, in professional service, so chief marketing job, officer jobs. So she found an organization called the Legal Marketing Association. And she uh-huh. thought, you know what? I bet these people hang out there. So she shows up at her very first lunch as she tells the story. And she walks in and the organizers are getting ready for the lunch and they're a bit disorganized. And the name tag table is a bit of a hot mess. And so Jennifer the nice Texan she is, looks over and says, can I give you a hand with that? Sure. And they were like, yes. Yay. <laughs> and it was the last, as she said, it was the last time she saw the organizers until the end of the lunch. And she walked into that lunch knowing no one. She left with 80 solid leads because there was 80 people at the lunch. Sure. And with, she took the name tag table, She took all the name tags. She handed them out individually. She introduced herself to each person. And from knowing no one, she all of a sudden had 80 solid leads. I mean, that's huge. And most people could walk in and go, oh, God, what a disorganized organization. They don't have a, you know, nothing. Everything looks like scattered rather than saying, this is an opportunity for me. Yeah. You know, one of the things that made me think of this, in tech, you know, golf, and I'm sure it is in lots and lots of industries, but in tech, golf is like it for, you know, executives. Mm-hmm. That's, that's what they want to do. And so I always just tell my buddy after being years of these, like, I'd much rather be back at the clubhouse organizing and take care of lunch and those types of stuff. Well, I love to play golf, but that just means I'm talking to three other people. If I'm back helping, you know, like organizing the the uh, name table things or, or getting the people set up in their foursomes and that kind of I meet three quarters of the people compared to, you know, the two, the three other people I would enjoy four hours with, with golf. So it's, it's a different perspective. It really yeah, is. You know, the, the times when you need to like cast the wide net and meet lots of, or the times where you need to double down and yep. deepen relationships and kind of getting the right kind of almost like, you know, like driving, you know, driving stick, you know, which foot is doing what and which time, like right. it's just reali- realizing that. Well, what a great insight to write a book. So um, are you, what else are you, are you doing anything else with this? Are you um, putting together courses or what's next with this whole thing? Well, it's it, I'm going to say, maybe it's the benefit of the past year. I get a get time to stop and breathe and, and figure out <laughs> that because the, the book came out and it was go, go, go. I mean, sure. being, being an author, whether you have a big publisher behind you, as I do Penguin Random House or you self publish or do a hybrid model, you, you know, authors are their own marketing machines. Yep. Uh, and so I have the good fortune of having a topic that lots of people need help on. And sure. so since the book came out, I'm uh, running around doing a lot of speaking um, across the country, across the globe, and uh, in the past year, kind of thinking, okay, what, what are the ways that we take this and move this forward? Uh, and what I'm actually working on right now is, um, it's a part that I touch and build your dream network on the differences in 
networks by gender, but there's some really interesting social science research on how successful women have structurally different networks than anybody else. And so I'm doing a lot of kind of research and, and looking into that uh, because, you know, hey, getting more women to be successful would be nice. Is, um, let's touch on that for just a moment. In your initial research and pulling that together, what's, what's the big difference? Well, there's two types of networks and, and they're, um, they are genderized as a stereotype. So typically, women have narrow, deep networks. You know, right. networks where you've spent a lot of time getting to know people, you've invested time, you know a lot about them. Um, it, this means, you know, you've got people you can call in an urgency, you can get feedback, you know, maybe know everyone in your industry because, you know, that's a, like an expert network. And you can see on, on suddenly, like you can see the strength in that network, but you can also see the weakness. Mm -hmm. The other network, which is typically associated with men, is a broad, shallow network. And that's a network that cuts across industries, sectors, titles, you know, divisions, but there's not the depth of knowing anybody, right? Sure. So I agree you, with that. It, um, it, it's more of an acquaintance network and it more relies on activity. Yeah. So you can see the strength of it because if you want an idea to travel far, you need that broad, shallow network. Yeah. Um, but it is also interestingly, Rex, it's the network that has shrunk for all of us during the past year because it's based on activity and we're not seeing people as right. much. Exactly. Okay. So, uh, so you can see women's networks, men's networks. And as I say in Build Your Dream Network, you need both. Yes. But what the social science research is showing, it is really critical for women that they do have both and they use both. And that is that they are positioned in centrality in a broad public, you know, broad shallow network, sort of a, um, where you would get the public information flows within your industry or your sector, mm -hmm. where someone who was an acquaintance would tell you that something's going on and you can act on it without a whole bunch of double, triple checking, or you're not hearing about things three weeks later and thinking, oh God, I didn't know that was going on, right? Sure, so there's, sure. a, there's a necessity of having that. And more critically, uh, and equally critically, that's probably a better way of putting it, Surrounding yourself with a close clique or cohort of like-minded women, primarily like-minded women, who have diverse non-overlapping networks. You don't want to get in an echo chamber with your close network. Sure. You know, because then <clears throat> it's an echo chamber and who needs that? You know, who needs groupthink when you're right, looking right. when you're looking for ideas and whatever? And like-minded so that you don't have, think about it. We all have close relationships when we want to do something. And they're like, oh, that's terrific. And you're like, okay, I need more than a cheering section. I need someone who says, you know what, Kelly, is that really a good idea? Have you thought this through? You know, you need, you need right. people who will challenge you. You need people who will be a sounding board. You need people who will say, gosh, I understand why you want to leave the legal profession, but have you thought about this rather than, you know, my family would have been like, oh, what are you doing? You're just about to be made partner. Don't leave the legal profession, right? Yeah. So that's, you know, um, that's that's the, the sort of the networking pieces of this success factors that successful women have this narrow, deep uh, network. They have this cohort that they lean on for professional uh, guidance and feedback and mentorship and mm. It is primarily like-minded women who will open doors, um, you know, give them perspective, um, give them that insider information that they wouldn't get from the also essential, you know, um, say acquaintance level broad network that, that they have. So they have and use both and they are careful to construct and develop both. So why do you think women have not really had as many of the broad and, and uh, shallow type associations or, or networks? Well, I think, I think we do. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting, you know, when you think about sort of the complexities on this, you know, first of all, you sort of think about how, um, 
I think I think about how women are uncomfortable tapping acquaintance level connections. Yep, for, oh, I would see that. Yep. Okay. Um, and at the same time, you know, we could all the headlines over women, how they've been adversely affected over the past year uh, because of COVID with job loss and, and leaving the workforce um, because of having, you know, double, triple duty between, you know, kids, schooling, yeah, aging would, parents, all that kind of good I stuff. I was about to go there because I was going to say yeah. um, a lot of times we see in the world that women, it would be my hypothesis that we would see in the world because of the demands of being caregivers and nurturers and mothers and all right. those other things that they just don't have time for lots of shallow connections. You know, well, they, it, it just, well, and I, you know, so you can make stereotypes about the emotional intelligence and w women wanting to get to know people before yes. they're going to ask for something. Whereas, right. you know, we can make, we can make the stereotypical joke about a guy, they meet someone immediately pitch them for business. Sure. But, but what we've seen, you know, in terms of, like I said, this massive network shrinkage that we've all suffered from. Yes. That men have been more adversely affected with their networks than women because men only, most men only have this broad, shallow network. Well, right? So they, that's so that, that is, yeah. So the ones where you don't see the security guard or, you know, yeah. Sally from accounting anymore and you work in finance and you don't see them because you're not crossing in the same, like all of those things. Whereas women's networks have mainly mean, been, um, the typical women's network has, has stayed intact because we've had those Deeper deep emotional and we've yeah. spent more time. But for women's careers to grow, like you can't grow a massive network only ba if you only stick to a model of, of investment, in t investment of time and getting to know people because there's just not enough hours in the day. Right, right, right. right. And so women really need to get comfortable with relationships stalling at acquaintance and realizing that you can provide value to them and them to you without needing to know birthdays, spouses, their pet's birthday, you know, sure. when they celebrate their, you know, parakeet's anniversary and all that good stuff. Well, I was just sitting here thinking, listening to you, pretty hard to pour beer on a Zoom meeting, right? Exactly. Exactly. And, and it's also kind of, uh, I think for all of us, you know, kind of putting aside our kind of perceptions and assumptions about what people want to do and how they want to engage. You know, mm -hmm. I think we need to realize our own network building preferences or where we're kind of stalling out um, and what somebody else's preference is. Because it's always been there, Rex, but we just don't ask people and we don't observe and listen, right? Yeah. We assume, assume a bunch of guys want to go golfing. Well, maybe they don't want to. Well, my, my smart aleck comment about beer, pouring beer on Zoom is, you know, that seems to be a glue for a lot of men's organizations, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> let's chug, mm -hmm. let's knock back some cold ones and we'll talk a little bit. And, you know, I, I was just listening as, as you were describing these, and I was thinking back on the different various types of organizations I've been in or networking groups. And you're absolutely right. You could walk out of a networking meeting with 50 cards as a guy, and you would feel just as entitled to call them and ask them for business as if you'd known for 10 years. I mean, cause that's mm -hmm. just, yeah, we, we had a, we had a beer and we stood in a circle and, and told jokes for a few minutes and now we're best friends. Right. So, right. Or, or, or now I know, Oh, I know what you do and I've got something that actually you need. And, and yeah. I think women need to understand that and say, right. you know what, that's not a bad thing. Um, I mean, one of the things I often say to people when they're um, thinking about careers, you know, whether it's, I don't know, law or anything else where building those relationships is essential. And I, mm -hmm. and I say to them, you know, ask how people are successful. How do they build relationships to get the client work? And then ask yourself, can you be successful doing that? Or is there some other way that you're going to need to build relationships? Yeah. Um, and I learned that lesson very early. I had a partner in a law firm I worked for and at the end, it was when I was doing, you know, my sort of first big restructuring mm -hmm. um, and bankruptcy case I, I referred to earlier. And uh, we went for lunch and I was in my early 20s and the partner I worked for was, you know, a little older than the two of us are right now. And yep. he said to me, Kelly, do you like what you're doing? And I said, I sure do. I really, really enjoying it. And I, I did. I really loved doing the banking and insolvency work. And he said, do you notice anything? 
about the bankruptcy bar, Kelly. And I'm thinking, I don't need to be Sherlock Holmes to come to the solution here. I said, yes, Ward, everyone looks like you. It is stale, male, and pale. It was a bunch of old dudes. <laughs> and uh, he said to me, yeah, and we all like to golf. So the question is, Kelly, do you like to golf? <laughs> and I looked at him, I said, I guess I'm going to learn. That's and he right. said to me, he said to me, that's the right answer. He said, I'll be happy to teach you. And here's why you must learn. This is where business gets decided in the bankruptcy bar in Toronto. And if you're not in that room, I can't assure that you're going to get the business. And so I'm always like, figure out how the relationships and where the relationships are made for business or find the workaround. You know, mm -hmm. like thinking about you taking the membership role. I, hey, I'll chair the membership committee, right? Find a workaround because relationships drive everything. Well, yeah, they certainly do. So tell me a little bit, share a little about your journey about writing the book. Was it what you thought the effort would be? Was it harder? Was it easier? What did that I, look like? I had never imagined writing a book until I was like pregnant with the idea of writing a book. Like I was obsessed with writing a book. Like I uh -huh. had to write a book. Um, I wrote in a very nonlinear fashion. Okay. Um, I had, so I had done a lot of blogging and things before. So I, you know, and had a newsletter that I, I had sent out during the time of the startup accelerator. So I had time to kind of, you know, develop my voice. Um, right. And, you know, for me, um, in writing uh, Build Your Dream Network, I had to put together a very detailed, you know, outline of what the book would be uh, as okay. part of the book proposal that went out to publishers. And, you know, the kind of thing, you know, you've got kids, you know, you need, you need kids, you're supposed to do like a, a detailed outline before you start writing an essay. Sure. And none, none of us ever did that when we were in school. We just kind of wrote the essay. That's um, right. Those detailed outlines are really handy when you're writing a book. <laughs> yes, yes. Especially if you're working with a publisher, you know, that's, that's helping you shepherd uh, or drive the, uh, the process. Um, yeah, absolutely. And you know what? And you're going to love this. Okay, so there, let me tell you, you know, I'm going to say a salesperson story that happened during the time with the book that made me add one more case study into the book, okay? Because you know what? Because you, like, you think like networking, the schmoozy part of networking, like sales, they kind of have a bad rap. Yep. And, and people cringe at the thought of this. So originally my book had a different title. The publisher wanted a new title, so we changed the title. But um, at the time, it had a different title, and it was called Open Your Own Doors. And I decided I needed to go and get that URL, and it was taken. So a friend of mine said, you know what? I know someone at Aftermarket's over at GoDaddy. Let me put you in touch with Joe, and he can go and buy that URL for you. And I'm like, great, put me in touch with Joe. So you think, what does Joe have? In it? Like, what's his interest in talking to me? What's the URL you want? how much you're going to spend for it, right? That's yeah. What, yeah, but probably people need. Instead, the first time I talked to Joe, he said, what's it for? And I told him, he said, well, that's interesting. He says, I kind of got a networking story of how I got to where I am in, in GoDaddy. And I said, tell me more, Joe. And about 15 minutes later, I said, Joe, could you go and ask your boss if you can have permission to tell your story so I can include it in my book? Um, you know, it was his, his, and it's one of my favorite case studies, uh, how he networked up the corporate ladder from, you know, an entry level job answering like customer service to being in aftermarkets. But, you know, for those who even think with sales that, you know, hey, what's the price and how soon do you need it? You know, stop, listen, talk to your customers. Why the urgency? What do they need it for? Um, you might unlock something, uh, you know, new and different. So, uh, yeah, I had four and a half months to deliver up the manuscript. Uh, to my publisher. So, you know, I, I wrote, just wrote the damn thing. Uh, but, uh, you know, having that detailed outline and popcorn popping around, getting it done and getting my word count right um, and delivering the manuscript on time became a full-time job for four and a half months. It's a journey. And a lot of people don't understand it. the amount of work it is. And then also too, sometimes it's hard for people when writing a book to um, take in I wouldn't say criticism, but the feedback or the, uh, the um, what's the right word I'm looking for? 
the editing <laughs> at mm -hmm. a severe level, some of the stuff, because we think, well, this is, you know, we can't see the forest because of the trees. I uh, worked with, and I'm going to have her back on the show here so soon, uh, a, a very famous uh, in her field, um, sports uh, surgeon, written several books. And I worked with her as help in the marketing for her books. And when we'd go to Chicago and meet with these publishers, you'd realize this is a product. It's not just, you know, my ramblings of of my essay paper, this is a product. It has to read like a product. It has right. to flow like a product. It has to feel like a product in those times. And so, you know, a lot of people, and I interview a lot of people with authors. I mean, I would probably say 70% of the people I interview on this show have books. And uh, it's a very, uh, you know, people have this idea of what writing a book is until they do it. <laughs> so. Right, right. And, and we're, we're all different. Like, I, I think I'd never imagined writing a book because I couldn't imagine writing a book. Like, yeah. I, like how, where would you start? And where would you finish? How would you put this thing together? Uh, and I often say to folks who are aspiring to write a book and that where they have the chance to go on that journey. I'm like, if you're going to work with a publisher, like just decide, and it could be if you're self-publishing too, decide which part of this book and this project your ego is really in and let the rest of it go. Oh, yes. Right? Uh, so when Penguin Random House came back to me and said they wanted to change the title, I'm like, okay. Yeah. My, my ego wasn't in that. Um, you know, they asked me about what color did I want on the cover? And my response was not orange. Uh, I didn't think that that was, it was, it was sort of funny in hindsight because orange really is sort of the brand color of Penguin Random House. But I didn't, <laughs> I, I, didn't, I, didn't want, I didn't want orange because when I went into Barnes and Noble and looked at other books in my category, they all had orange covers. Ah. And so I was like, I'm just gonna be in a sea of orange. Like, so please make it anything other than orange for that reason, this is not an insult on Penguin Random House Orange. I'm quite fond sure. of Penguin Random House Orange. Um, when my editor would send me changes, I mean, I really, this is when I pulled out my past life as a corporate attorney. You know, what were, what were the negotiations in a deal that I was like, fine, 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 fine. And which yeah. were the ones that I'm like, yeah, no, not so much, right? Yeah. Like, and, and that's the way I dealt with them. I didn't butts over them. I was like, Good change, good change, good change. And I think to this day, I may hold the record at Penguin Random House of turnaround of editors' edits the fastest because I would just turn them around in 24 hours and I'd be like, yeah, here. Okay, here you wow. You are gracious. And that's a little surprising being come from the legal uh, in tech. I, it wasn't something that we were required to do, but you just did so you could move it through the process. Uh, I've worked with all these Fortune 100 companies all the time we get these contracts for, you know, software delivery and SLAs and stuff. I'd read the doggone thing. And I would submit the ones that I think here's the, probably the issues we're going to have. With. So our corp corporate attorneys could pay attention, you know, kind of stuff. So I'd even yeah. talk to people who had sold other systems to them and said, well, what were the gotchas in the contracts? Because that was just part of it. So for you to be able to just say summarily, okay, on the changes, that's, that's yeah, impressive. I would I go through each one, but I took my ego out of it. Yeah. Right. Like it's my editor and she knows. And then there's also an element. Um, Penguin Random House's office is here in New York. You, you, you walk in through the revolving doors and there you have this, you know, what? 30 foot ceiling, vaulted ceiling yep. in a lobby. And it's all bookshelves and it is humbling. Sure. Right. When I look and see who they have published and who are Penguin Random House authors, and it is humbling. So yeah. there's an element of me that, you know, you got to trust the team around you yeah. uh, and they've got more experience and uh, let's, let's go with their suggestions. But, you know, there's the stuff I kept my ego in and fought <laughs> on and the other stuff I was like, no problem, baby, you go ahead and change it. I'm just happy to be in the Sistine Chapel. Thank you very much. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's great. Well, what, what an experience. And I think it's interesting, your, the book, your top of your book. And I think um, a lot of people really need to understand that. I think the impacts of uh, uh, the pandemic have been detrimental. I mean, just, uh, I didn't see my mother for 11 months. And so, um, and then when I did see her, it was uh, staying on the st out on the street singing Christmas carols while she was, you know, at a porch kind of thing. So I, I think people are starved for that interaction. I think people are ready to pick back up and have groups. I think there's a lot of guys out there that want to drink a little more beer, maybe, maybe some more women want to do the same thing, but I think it's, uh, it's something people need to double down on again is to regen 
the importance of those networks? We, I think we woke up in the last year on how important relationships are and yeah. how critical both the close relationships as well as those casual interactions, you know, like talking with a barista in a Starbucks, you know, uh, saying hello to people. Uh, yeah. You know, as a, a friend of mine said, she said, Kelly, I went to the dentist for the first time since, you know, the start of, you know, uh, quarantining. And she said, I realized, you know, after I had my teeth cleaning, that I couldn't shut up. I was just like talking to the dentist and the technicians and I wasn't leaving the dentist's office. Like right. who does that? Who does that? She says to me. And and they looked at her and they said, don't worry, everybody does. I think we're starved for human connection. And I think we've really woken up. And that, if there's going to be a silver lining and maybe some positivity out of this experience, that's a damn good one in my mind. I think it is. And then I'm also going to throw in one that's a little bit uh, on the converse side of this. We've learned through the Zoom. I mean, here we are conducting interview, you know, 1,500 miles apart, 1,800 miles apart. We, we booked all this without even saying a word to each other. And we, we get here. I'm not saying this is the way I prefer to do it because I'm not I'm a people person. But I also think a lot of people woken up to, wow, there's a lot of meetings I could just have done quickly. So now I, the ones I do want to have in person that can be higher quality. And so a lot of these Tic Tac things can get out of the way. Right, well, and well, the other piece of it, I am gonna make a wild guess, Rex, that when I can travel again and I find myself coming through the Denver area and I'm like, Rex, where's that beer? Uh, That's right. <laughs> my guess is the person who shows up to have a beer with me is gonna be the person I'm talking to right now. And sure. that, the, the networkers of the future who are going to succeed are, as I like to say, people who are amphibious. Mm -hmm. They can equally build and maintain relationships offline, online, and online to offline. And That's a really you, we, point. Need, we need to be able to move. And the only way to do that is if you bring truly who you are to these digital platforms. Yep. If you have some kind of other crafted brand for online and then I meet you in person and you're not that person, yeah, uh, it's just so not going to fly. Not going to fly. Well, I used to think what I heard when I was a kid growing up, it's not what you know, it's who you know. Okay, well, that's important, but I don't think that's the, the key thing anymore. I think it's who you know how well, because uh, I can, if, you know, back in the early days, let's look back at the early days of social media. When Facebook first came out or Twitter or even LinkedIn, people were just throwing out connections all over the place. And it was this race to these numbers. You know, I got 500 connections, 1,000 connections, 3,000, 5,000, whatever. Well, if you're not connected to those people, then it's, they're just digital strangers. They're just digital hallway passers. So I think today and more and more, uh, I think pandemic has woken up to a lot. It's not just who you know, it's how well you know those people. And then how do you nurture those? I mean, I, 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 I absolutely agree. Or, or one of the things I've always said to people in the sort of the, this digital age, not who you know or what you know, but who knows what you know. Yeah. All right. Like, do, do they know what you're doing? Do you know what they're doing? Do you know how you can help each other? Are you aware of it? Um, and well, it's great to make, you know, connections on social, you know, understanding it's this journey to getting to know them. Um, and vanity metrics, you know, particularly on platforms like LinkedIn are just absolutely useless. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. Well, I've, I've uh, enjoyed our time today. You've been very generous with it. And I will have you back because I want to go in. I try to keep the shows roughly around the same time, but I'd like to go back in and talk about some of the practical things that people can do to be ahead of the game these days and have a genuine network, an authentic network not just yeah. a numbers network, um, but we'll get to that. That will be a part two. So I have to ask this question today because it's just part of the ritual. You know, we all have these bucket lists in life of things we want to do before we're, we're done. Okay. But there's always an opposite in the world and she's grinning. There's always an opposite in the world of every law. So the opposite of the things you'd love to do is the things you wouldn't do. It start. it rhymes with bucket and starts with an F, but I'm not going to say that. So what might be something that is found on your effort list? And it can be something trivial, like I don't like sardines, because that's like right there on the, near the top of mine. Or it could be something, you know, big and esoterical, like 
I'm never going to not try to get to the, the moon. So uh, what might be something on your effort list? Because you've shared a lot about yourself today. Wow, that is such a good question. What's one thing, what's something I don't want to do? You know what? Hmm. Hard to me imagine going back and working in an office nine to five. I like keeping my own schedule. That's really good. I, I've had a few people of that. That's kind of the nature of a lot of people I've, uh, but no, I agree with that 100%. I wouldn't, you know, you know, tie me, tie me up, tape me up to a chair and force me to listen to Wayne Net Newton records for days. That would be much more uh, pleasurable than to have me go back into an office uh, to go into a W-2 role. I'm sorry, I, you'd have to staple my hands to the table and drill, drill into them before I would even consider that. So no, I'm not going to do that either. So. All right. It's been great today. This I appreciate been it. So coming. much fun. So yeah. much fun, Rex. I am so deeply appreciative. Thank you and, for having me. And we'll get you back for part two because I want to deep dive on this. Okay, folks, that's it. Uh, thank you for dialing in, listening today. Don't forget to check out the website to learn more about Kelly's um, story and her book and all the things that she's doing. And it's exciting to have great guests on the show. So until next time, don't forget these three things. Be safe, be bold, and make it a great day.